All right. Good morning. All right, good. We got a lively bunch this morning. Glad to hear that. I hope that y'all have enjoyed your week. And this is the start of the week. Today is the start, and it's always a good way to start your day, uh, start your week at church. And in the Word of God, fellowshipping with the saints and all of those things that come along with that, what a blessing. Let's go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter number 8. John chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to begin in verse number 31, John chapter 8, verse 31. Let's teach a little bit this morning. <clears throat> then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now asking... Lord, that you would bless this time. Father, that you would give me unction, give me wisdom and understanding, help me to teach. I pray, God, that you'd open the hearts of your people now. Lord, maybe there's someone here that's lost, that you would open their heart to the truth of your word. But Father, for your people, I pray, God, that we would be edified, lifted up in the word of God as we are encouraged to see where you have brought us from and what you've brought us into. I pray that you would bless us now in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. All right, so I want to draw your attention to verse number 34 here. And uh, I want you to note what John records for us here is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Jesus answered them. And this is to the Jews in verse 31 who had believed on him. And I, I got to say this, their faith was simple. Their faith was weak. Um, they had not seen the full manifestation of what Jesus would be as their Messiah, but they were believing on him insofar as what they knew. They, uh, they were like, who is that, Apollos, who's going around and he's mighty in the scriptures and he's teaching only the baptism of John and, and then uh, Priscilla and Aquila instruct him f more perfectly in the way of salvation. They're kind of like that. They're weak. They're, they're children in their faith in that sense that they just have a very simple faith. They just believe in what they can see so far. But they don't have a full understanding of the real manifestation of what's going to happen in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, but Jesus here is going to bring them. He's going to call them farther along than they ever thought that they would be brought as he would uh, complete the work of Messiah on the cross and then go through the tomb and then in his resurrection... Uh, if they follow along through all that, they're going to see some mighty marvelous things. And there's a lot of things that are difficult for many people to hear and receive and understand and continue on in that belief and in, in that seed of faith. Uh, but here he hits them with some very hard truth in verse 34. So he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. <clears throat> now, I've got a whosoever salvation, amen? And here he says, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, how many of you have sinned since you got saved? Woe is me. Some of us could get down and do some confessing and forsaking right now. Maybe we need to do that. It's good to do that before you get to church on Sunday, amen? I mean, it's all right to confess and forsake in church, but if you knew about it before you got here, you should have already done it. But anyways, we're going to explain this, and we're going to look at this, and uh, as, as they do in Nehemiah, we're going to read the text aloud. We're going to uh, give the sense and cause you to understand it, I hope. That's the goal with any good biblical teaching and preaching. John's going to use this phrase, whosoever committeth sin, again, in his epistle, 1 John, and we're going to look at that here shortly, but for right now, 
we're just going to understand this. That this is talking about the difference. Or excuse me, we need to make a distinction that this is not talking about a Christian who sins. So, you're not the servant of sin. If you're born again, you no longer are the servant of sin. You have a different master now. We'll get more into that, but this is, there's a distinction that needs to be drawn between a lost person who is sold out for sin and a saved man who is struggling against sin. So look at this word committeth with me, and this brings the idea of making one to tarry long in sin. It has the idea that you're also doing. It is a life of doing. Um, outside of uh, Jesus Christ, our life is only what do we do, what do we do, what do we do. And many people, for a long period of time, many people, while the culture was very religious, were very worried about what they did and what they would do, and, and they made themselves to appear something, and many of them made themselves to appear something that they are not. Anybody ever been there, played the hypocrite, right? You know, um, that hypocrite, it's for... Um, you look back in the days of acting as it begins out and they're doing plays and a person would come out and they'd do a play and they would have multiple masks in their pocket and they would pull out a mask and they'd be this character. Pull out a mask and be that character. And that's the idea of a hypocrite, that you just wear a mask that doesn't really belong to you and you play a part for a period of time, but eventually you throw that mask to the side and you pick up another one. There are many people who are like that, um, but there were... The, the fact of the matter is that that's just what's going to happen all the time. We're always going to have hypocrites. Um, that, that's just, and, and many times we're going to play that part. And we need to be mindful that we don't do that. Because there's nothing more ridiculous than a hypocrite. I mean, think of the times when you've played the hypocrite. How sh ashamed do you feel of yourself? I mean, we get caught doing one sin or another, and we get real upset. But it almost feels like playing the hypocrite, we just kind of get away with that one. And we don't really get too upset. You need to be worried if you're not upset when you realize you've played the hypocrite. You need to be wondering how you're... Take, that's a good way of checking your spiritual temperature. How close are you to God is, is how much you'll be convicted over your sin. That'll tell you how close you are to God. How much conviction you have over every little sin is how close you are to God. That's a measure of that. So whereas the pattern of life uh, for a believer is a pattern where the, the pattern of sin is broken in our lives through the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, we war against its efforts. Lost people are in a completely unbroken pattern of sin. There's no break between a lost person and sin from life's first cry to final breath. Except that the Lord Jesus Christ reaches down and saves that sinner. Boy, it's quiet in here. Look at 1 John 3, 8. John's going to help solidify this for us here. 1 John 3, in verse 8. He that committeth sin, note that word committeth again, that's the same Greek word, means to tarry long, to, to, to be made to do or to make yourself to do something or to be in the act of doing con constantly. He that committeth sin is of the devil. And he's going to define what this committing sin is. And he's going to use the devil as an object lesson. For the devil sinneth, he never stops sinning from the beginning. Okay? We just need to park here for a second and uh, recognize how sinful we were outside of Jesus Christ. Um, it wasn't that we had a rough upbringing. It wasn't that our parents didn't guide us well enough. It wasn't that we lacked opportunity. Um, it wasn't that we just didn't have proper motivation. And if somebody had to come along and really boosted our self-esteem, everything would have been better. It's none of that. 
but it is the fact that um, we are all a byproduct of the mastery of sin in our lives. From the womb to the tomb. Now, let me make the distinction here. Pastor was very, uh, very uh, correct in, in what he said the other day when he's addressing this buffoon online, whoever it may be, who's set, telling people that babies go to hell. That man has no understanding of the scriptures and he's twisting them and he's wicked and he needs to repent and trust on Jesus. Um, the reason babies don't go to hell is because babies don't understand the difference between good and evil. You realize when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that they became as God and they understood the difference between good and evil. They didn't know they were naked because they didn't know that there was a, a good or a bad thing about being naked. They had no clue of it. And babies, likewise, are in, innocent and, and even many children and people with mental deficiencies and handicaps. And, and I believe that it's, it's only accurate to translate and understand and interpret the Bible to say that those people who never come to a mind where they can discern good and evil will be trophies of God's grace in heaven. So the baby that um, passed away, uh, our first child who passed away in the womb, is a trophy of God's grace. Note this, the baby doesn't deserve the grace of God any more than we do. Um, the wrath of God still abides upon sin. And sin is still sin. But God is gracious and in that condition of innocence for a baby, for a person who's mentally deficient from birth, who never comes to understand what sin is, God is gracious to that person. And when Jesus is nailed to the cross, the sins of those people are laid upon him. Graciously and mercifully, he bears their sin. You say, well, my baby doesn't sin. You need to wait. I heard one old preacher, he said, they're, diaper, uh, they're vipers and diapers. <laughs> babies are wonderful. I love babies. Most of them are even just downright adorable. Some of them, you know, anyways, I'll be in trouble now. I always start with my son. He was a little rough coming out, but he, he looks darn good now. I love him. But at the moment a child comes to understand good and evil... Our heart is like Ahab's. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. It's not just that we, we sin ignorantly um, when we're babies, because um, that's how our sin is when we're babies or when we're small children and we just don't understand. Um, but once we come to understand, we kick it up a notch. And we are like Ahab and we sell ourselves to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And it's not only that, but it is the fact that the whole world is on the same playbook, that we're in the same playbook on the same page, and as soon as you get a desire to do something wicked, the world comes along and it encourages you and it stirs you up. It says here, um, he did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. In other words, it's not that we are alone in this and we are just, uh, you know, it's, it's something that that comes to our heart and, and, and it's something that we do in secret. But you remember when you were out in the world in sin, uh, how that there were people uh, around you and they encouraged you and they said, oh, just one more drink. I'll oh, just one more smoke. I'll oh, just one more dope. Uh, one more this, one more that. One more time around the, uh, around the block of fornication and of idolatry and of lasciviousness and of unrighteousness and all these things. And, and I'll tell you what, those were not our friends. They were not our friends. They were against us because they were only desirous to bring us more along in unrighteousness. Right? They're going to think it's strange of you when you won't run to uh, the excess of riot with them. 
In other words, you're going to be a weirdo. Are you a weirdo for Jesus? I mean, do you find yourself captivated by the sins of your past? There's some help in here for you then. Sometimes we get drawn back into a pattern of sin. But we need to understand that this is not what God has for us. Remember, it's not that we're not walking towards God before we're saved. It's that we are running in the opposite direction of God. And that we are running headlong into sin. And we are completely bound in our sin. Proverbs 5.22 says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. I'm going to do an example here, and I don't have what I need to do it exactly, but, but I'll do my best. Imagine you have here, this one's already got a crease in it, but let's just imagine this is a perfect piece of paper. I got this illustration from a preacher friend of mine, his wife. This is a perfect piece of paper. It's got no mark on it. Just imagine that. It's already got some, you know. But anyways, imagine it's perfect. This is your life. It's a perfect sheet of white paper. And this is the sin. There's one sin. That's one sin. You want to try and get that crease out? How many of y'all tried to get the crease out of your paper before? You never quite get it back to where it was. But it's not just that, but there's another sin. And you unfold it again. Let's try and get it out of that. Oh, I messed it up trying to get it out, man. I just can't get it right. And, oh, but there's another sin right there. And there, there's one right here. And then there's one there. And here's a sin. And they're just everywhere. And all of a sudden, you've got this. And it's a messed up, marred piece of paper. And that's what sin has been doing to our lives. These are the cords of sin. You can't get the creases out of your life. But God comes along, the Lord Jesus Christ comes along, and he takes you and he plucks you out of hell. And he takes this perfect white piece of paper, and he takes your filthy one, and he takes this filthy one and lays it upon him on the cross. And he takes his perfect one and lays it upon you so that when God looks at you, he sees a perfectly clean piece of paper. No creases, no blemishes, no blots, nothing. But he takes all this. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. We were bound in the cords of sin. So what does this make that one who is bound in this unbroken pattern of sin where your life is just a creased up piece of paper and it never gets better? You can't get the creases out? What, what, what is that condition of that man, that woman, that young person? Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now that Greek word there for servant is doulos. And if you go and look in the English dictionary, you're going to find that that word servant can mean a multitude of different things, but it literally means a person who is a slave, a person who is a bondman, a, a person who is a servant to a master. In other words, it's not just that you got bought by Jesus and now you have a master, but before you know Jesus, you have a master. And that master, you are the servant, you are the slave of sin. And while some despise Christianity and they call the sheep mindless, um, how should I say it? They call the sheep mindless slaves of their religion and their to-do lists and to-don't lists. Um, they don't realize that they themselves are currently, presently, actively, and vigorously slaves to sin. Outside of Christ, you are only free from righteousness. Did you catch that? You are free from any restraint, any obligation, any desire, any motivation towards righteousness. You can't do it. Um, let's put it this way. Without faith, it is possible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith works by love. Okay? So here's what we see there is that outside of faith, we cannot please God and faith only works by love. So we are bound in the hatred of righteousness when we are not in Christ. When we are slaves to the master, which is sin, we are bound in hatred to righteousness, which makes us free from righteousness. We have no desire for righteousness. Now, you have a desire to put on a good show and make yourself look right in a self-righteous manner. You may want, to, I, I tell you, there's a man, he wanted to be a preacher and, and he just desired to be a pastor and, and that was his goal. But he was inside a ravening, evil, wicked, godless person. And his testimony is that he was studying to be a pastor in a seminary, but he would lie and cheat and steal and abuse people and he just did it all so that he could elevate himself higher. If you weren't up to his doctrinal standards, he would cut you down uh, like a rotten log. He did not care about anything and God reached down and saved him and he showed him everything that he had been pursuing that was a form of godliness. He had been denying the power thereof the whole time and he was free from any form of righteousness because there was nothing that he was doing that was actual righteousness because God looks at the, at the desire and the thoughts and the intent of the heart when he sees what you do, not, the, uh, not just the outward facade. Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of, sin, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The wages of sin is death. Do you understand that? If you're outside of Christ, you are earning wages right now. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift. That's the condition of those who are slaves to sin. Look again at John 8. John 8 and verse 35 now. We're going to try and get through all three or four of these verses, however many we can get to. That's the condition of those who are slaves to sin, that they are, they are bound for death. Um... And now we're going to see this, John 8, 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Note this. There will always be, as I said at the beginning, fair weather faithful. As long as things are easy going, as long as there's bread, there's meat, there's water, there's wine, whatever the case may be, those people will be faithful. I mean, they are excited to be there when God is doing what they expect he should do for them because they have needs. They have wants, really, is what they have. But they feel that God is under obligation to do what is good in their eyes. But God forbid that that should ever be a part of the measure of our relationship with God that we oblige God to perform things on our behalf as a means by which he can continue to entertain us well enough so that we will reside in his presence. That's not the way that we come to God. And those kind of people are fair weather followers. They're the kind of people who when the Lord taught about the eating of his body and the drinking of his blood and he applied it spiritually, although they could not discern that because they were carnal. It's like those people, those disciples who left from following him. They were done. It got hard. They're done. They weren't in for the long haul. They went out from among us to prove they, they were not of us, for had they been of us, they would have continued with us. 
And it's not just that they stumbled back in sin and they backslid and, and they, they continued to profess faith in the Lord, uh, but they were struggling and they were getting defeated and overwhelmed by sin and they were in a battle and a war. It's that they said, nah, I'm done with this. Those are the people who go out and prove that they're not of us. That saint who got overwhelmed, consumed, they got overtaken by sin, they're in a fault and they have not yet been restored or God has not yet taken them out of here, that person is still saved. But the person who just says, I'm done with this Jesus crap, it's garbage. I'm an atheist now. I hate all that religious crap. That Christianity, it's, it's junk. I ha it's dung. I don't like it. That one never was a follower. We have people like that in churches today. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That's, that's what we're dealing with. The problem is not the world out there. It's what we let into the church here. I, I, I want to say this, and I want to be cautious. But I talked to somebody who was a former member here. And this is the mind of the world. This is the mind of people who can come to church and, and, and put on a show, but really they got, they got no go. I didn't mean to alliterate or rhyme there, but. Talked with somebody and they left here. They were done. And I found out that the whole time they were here, they had put on a show because they did not believe that salvation is by grace through faith. They believed that you had to measure or you had to attain a certain measure of righteousness to present yourself before God. They did not believe that much, if any, of Paul's writings were scripture. Under this pulpit? Under this preaching? And that's what they believed the whole time? Uh, un, under, the, under the leadership and the guidance of, of, the, of the man of God that God has set here for us and they were willing enough to be deceitful and deceptive and lie as if they were along with us but they were antichrist Paul's not Paul's probably not even an apostle I mean Obviously, we can't, under, we can't agree with everything he says because he's so narcissistic uh, that he's, he's, he just wants to make himself look good. What? I'm not saying you all need to be super hypocritical of the person. You know, look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> Hunt out the wolves. Get your guns, ladies. I know there's probably more women here carrying guns than men. Us men think we're tough. I'm just going to brawl it out. I'm going to go grab a gun. I ain't going to brawl it out. Anyways. But here's the thing. I mean, that's what can sneak into a church, into a Bible-believing, sold-out, heart-for-God church. But guess what? The longer that something like that dwells in light, the more likely it is, and the brighter the light the more likely it is that it's going to get expulged, expunged. It's going to get pushed out. It'll be exposed eventually, and that's what happened. They had to, they had to get and go. They couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle the Word of God. I mean, believed he was a modern-day prophet, member of a church here, deceitful, deceptive, what a scary thing, right? But here's what Jesus said in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. And note this, this is a, this is a belief that's not, not full yet because they don't really know what is going to happen. They're just believing in Messiah. They're believing on Jesus as their Messiah, but they don't quite understand what's happening yet. They don't know the fullness uh, of the extent of what he's, his person and work is. Uh, some of them don't understand his deity yet. They don't understand uh, the, the passion that's about to come. They don't understand all those things, right? Most of them don't understand any of that. And they're just coming along because they're like, yes, we, we are ready for the Messiah to do what? To deliver us from our sin? No, from Rome. I and mean, that's what they wanted. 
Even the disciples, the apostles, uh, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? I mean, you're like, guys, I picked you guys on purpose. Like, you're thinking about the wrong thing here, right? We're going to spread a different kind of kingdom, the kingdom of God, and we are going to, like, flip the world upside down, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying here? They didn't. And these people, in the same sense, they, they just didn't have a full understanding yet. They, they, they had not taken part of the new birth and all of those things. And here's what Jesus says to them, those Jews which believe in him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now note that word, continue, is similar to the word committeth. But the word committeth has the sense, again, as I said, of making or doing something. Or, or uh, of your own will, you like dive into something. But this, this word which says, um, <clears throat> excuse me, continue, no, it says... Um, it has the idea of, of a resolved perseverance to tarry or to stand firm. Now, to commit it, that was to tarry long in sin in that context. But this is to tarry by standing firm in a truth. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. That's where we find our strength, not in the doing that we can have or not in the making happen that we perform, but in the fact that we stand firmly planted on a rock. Note this. It's a resolved perseverance to tarry, to stand firm. If, that, if you do that, then are you my disciples indeed. Note that a disciple is a student. Now, a disciple can be used in two ways. There's two ways you use it. A disciple is one who goes and works, and you, and you practice discipleship. But to be a disciple is to just be a learner of one. And these are learners. They are learners. They are learning. They are soaking up what he's saying. And when you continue on, when you are resolved to persevere and tarry and stand firm on truth, on the word that Jesus is speaking, and not just stand on a cursory knowledge of Jesus, but go full on to a full manifestation of his person and work, then in verse 32 it says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's not about putting on a good show. It's not about uh, uh, just gotten some T's and... Uh, crossing some eyes, I said that backwards, but God calls us to know truth. While some put on the act of faith and they appear to belong in the house, remember what I just said a minute ago? They appear to belong in the house, but they really don't. There's only one that can abide in the house forever. There's only one that has the right to abide ever, and that is the son. Now, here's the thing. So the son is the only one who can remain in the house forever. And therefore the son is the only one who can make anyone else to abide or remain in the house forever. Do you see the picture that he's painting here? Now they didn't understand this fully at the time, but look at how beautiful this. For this purpose, the son of God was manifest, John 8, 36, right? That he might destroy the works of the devil that he might overcome the power of the wicked one, that he might condemn sin and death and, 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 over, and, and, uh, and declare righteousness. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, you who were a servant to sin, you who were under the mastery of sin, who had no ability in and of yourself to please God, except that you turn, repent, and believe on the gospel, um, that one, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And look at this beautiful picture. The Son who belongs in the house sees you lost and undone, trying to fit in, and to him you stick out like a sore thumb. He sees you. He sees that you don't really belong, but the Son comes to you in his graciousness, in his mercy, and in his position of authority. And where you were once a slave to sin, bound in the cords of your sins, he has now broken the cords as you repent and believe the gospel and makes you now a slave to the true master, to the perfect master, to the good shepherd, to the good Lord. While sin had led you to death, this master leads you to eternal life. Turn with me to Romans 6. 
and we've got about five or ten more minutes, and we're just going to read this. Maybe I'll teach a little bit, but I think we just need to get this in our hearts and in our minds. I think it'll help establish something for you. The point of all of this, let me say this right now, the point of all of this is to make us consider our own selves, examine our hearts, and say, Lord, am I just putting on a show? Am I just trying to manifest something that's not an actual reality in my heart? It, okay, no, that's not me, Lord. Or yes, that is me. You need to turn to Jesus now. Because your master is sin. And you need a good master. You need Jesus. But if that's not you, but you're struggling with sin, I want to tell you distinctly what Paul's going to say here in Romans 6. And that is that you are no longer bound to sin. You are free from sin. Now, does that mean we won't sin? No. God forbid. That's not the case. And I say God forbid because if that was the case, then you might as well take us on to heaven. Because we have nothing else to learn here. But our sin is what is the, gives us opportunities to draw nigh to God. Let me say that again because I don't know if you understood it. Our sin is what gives us opportunities to draw nigh to God. Because in our sin, we have conviction through the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost convicts us, we are drawn to confess our sin. And when we confess our sin, we have to go where? To the throne of grace. And as we go to the throne of grace, we get closer to the presence of God. And the closer we are to the presence of God, the farther we are from the power of sin. Are you following me? Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is, this is us, praise God. Our old man is crucified with Jesus. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Remember before, we were freed from righteousness. Now we're freed from sin in Christ. You're struggling with sin. You need to go to Jesus. How do I go to Jesus? You go to his word. You get on your knees. You pray to God. You ask God for wisdom. You ask God to reveal your heart to you so that you can understand what is drawing you back to this pattern of unrighteousness that you abhor, but that the flesh is so powerful. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in a sense, it's powerful because it continues to pull towards that thing. But we need to be freed from sin. Not we need to be, excuse me, strike that. We need to recognize that we have been freed from sin. Okay, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death no more hath dominion over you. Death, the power of sin, or the sting of sin, what does he say? The sting of sin is death. Right? The power of sin is the law. Okay, so we're freed from the power of death, the dominion of death over our life. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth, and this is how we ought to live unto God. Likewise, the same way that he lives to God, the same way that he died and was buried and resurrected, that exact same ways, likewise, we should reckon or account ourselves also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the imperative command. This is a command. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin. He's explaining what the result of all this is. For sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not that sin is taking liberty and it's gaining dominion here and there. What he's trying to say to you is that sin can't have dominion over you because you can't have two kings sitting on the throne of your heart. It's either sin or it's Jesus. Do not give authority and power to sin in your life by saying, well, I just can't overcome it. No, that's exactly right. You can't, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we have overcome by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ all things. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under the grace. Remember, the power of sin is the law. What then? Shall we sin because we are not in the law, but under the grace? God forbid. Know ye not... 
Do you not understand this? Know ye not? Praise the Lord. My heart just got blessed. <laughs> Some of y'all will know about it in a minute. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin, this is the, the, the condition of the person who is a slave to sin, uh, is that they are completely bound and there is no opportunity for them to be free unto, unto righteousness. They are free from righteousness. They cannot pursue God. They do not pursue good things. Their heart is evil. Their tongues are full of venom's ass, all of this thing. They are wicked and vile. Uh, the outside of the cup is clean, but the inside is wicked and vile. And they're like ravenous wolves. They're evildoers, seducers all of these things that the Bible uses to describe them and that condition of that person, the, the, uh, the consequence of all of that is death, sin unto death or which one are you obeying? Of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Note this, if you are born again, you can sin till you die. In other words, you can, you can go so far and run so hard from God in rebellion to what you know is right, in rebellion to, to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, that God will take you out of here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you don't know what that is, just go home and read it. Uh, give him over, hand him over to, to the devil for the destruction of the body that the soul may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Some people have gone out of here before they should have. Before they, they really should have because they have let themselves run back into sin. I want you to understand that the sin is powerful. The flesh is powerful in a sense in its weakness towards its desire towards sin. But God is so much greater than all that. The Holy Spirit is so much greater than all that. The Father, His presence in our life is so much greater than all that. The blood of Jesus Christ is so much greater than all of that. We do not have to be subject to these things. That sin leads unto death, but we can obey, note this, unto righteousness. It says in verse 17, Ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Notice that your conversion, that moment of faith, was an instantaneous moment of obedience. Your life as a Christian begins in obedience and would to God that it ends in obedience. Verse 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. There's that scripture there to back up what I've been saying this whole time. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You ought to be so ashamed of what you were before. I'm so ashamed of the sin that I committed outside of Christ. I'm ashamed of the sins I've committed inside of Christ. We should not glory in our sin, but we should be ashamed of it and cast it off. Uh, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He is telling us time and time again. He is building a perfect argument as a master of the law. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The condition of those who are bound in sin is the fact that they are wrapped in the cords of their sin so tightly that they cannot escape and they cannot even perform one good thing for the glory of God outside of the fact that God turns what they meant for evil, like Joseph's brother, into good and into his glory. But the, the condition of those who are saved and born again is the fact that their life is now dedicated unto holiness, unto obedience, and unto an end of everlasting life. And he strikes us here with this verse that we can all probably quote, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And with that, we're going to close this morning. I thank you for your attention. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have provided such an excellent, perfect, and un uh, undeniable gift in Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray that you would use this word now, that it would strengthen your body. 
the body of Christ, God, that you would um, embolden us, that we would uh, make war once again with sins that we have just kind of left by the wayside uh, in our battle against unrighteousness and unholiness in our own lives. Uh, Father, uh, knowing this, that we have, uh, we have sometimes been lazy and just said, well, I'll get victory over it at least for a while, but God, we can have victory. I mean, there is victory in Jesus, not only in the sense that we have been redeemed, but God, that you are redeeming our very life. Lord, let us be emboldened and encouraged by your word now, understanding that God, you are our master, that sin no more has dominion over us, that death is not our end, but everlasting life. Help us to be living, longing, loving the Lord, your son. We pray through his name. Amen.